Hi, everyone. This is lecture two on quantum simulation. Today, we're going to talk about quantum simulation of lattice gauge theories. In lecture one, we talked about Hamiltonian formulation of lattice gauge theories. That is the basis for quantum simulation. It is very important that you know about the Hamiltonian formulation to be able to um, discuss and work through projects for quantum simulation. However, for the sake of this talk, it is not um, supposed to be a prerequisite. You can still follow and understand the material for, for this lecture. And therefore, you can actually watch and go through this, these lectures in any order you want, although the order lecture one and two makes more sense. All right, so today's lecture is gonna be a slight presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So let's see what are the basics of this program of quantum simulation, particularly in the context of lattice gauge theories that we would like to learn about. And then hopefully this is enough information for everyone to get interested and go look for more detailed analysis and discussion in various different topics and get more specialized um, in this, this area. This is the outline for lecture two that I um, had produced before. And in order to sort of cover and uh, learn about various different components of this lecture that I have planned, um, I have kind of a more practically oriented outline for, for this lecture. So the hope is that we could convey um, the, the, the goals of this lecture through the following items. So we're gonna go through understanding various different approaches to quantum simulation. This would be analog, digital, or hybrid approaches. We'll talk about the basic idea, a few examples, and then a more uh, sort of general comparison of the different approaches. Then we're going to talk about an example of a hardware that works in all these simulator modes, including analog, digital, and hybrid modes. This is a trapped ion quantum simulator. And of course, you can apply the same discussions to many other different simulators that are out there. We talk about the physics of trapped ions to understand how basic quantum operations are performed in these systems. And then um, um, how these operations vary in different each in each mode of the simulator. And then finally, in the context of lattice gauge theory, we pick an example, lattice Schrodinger model. We already talked about Hamiltonian formulation of the U1 lattice gauge theory in one plus one dimension, the lattice Schrodinger model. We're going to take this as a test bed for um, kind of working out these simulation approaches in digital, analog, and hybrid way. So that's really the outline for what we're gonna do in the, the next hour. Um, so what's the basic idea of quantum simulations and what are the various approaches to it? Of course, the overarching goal of this program is to be able to use a controlled quantum system um, that we can have in the labs or we can have access in companies and uh, industry partners and then be able to program it um, in such a way that it can simulate the physics of QCD, a strong interaction systems in nature. And of course, we are long away from um, being able to achieve this goal. However, very uh, good progress is already started to really um, figuring out a step by a step how we can perform lattice QCD computations on a quantum computer or quantum simulator just in the same way that we perform lattice gauge theory program on a classical computer. Of course, it's not gonna be the same way. Uh, it's going to have its own um, different um, computational technologies and algorithms and way of thinking about these problems. And that's why we need to learn about the basics of this quantum simulation program first before wanting to apply it to the lattice gauge theory pro problem. So here is a slide on what are the different approaches to the simulation. You can imagine you have analog simulators. And in an analog simulator that I described in more detail in, in a little bit, you just evolve the system with the time evolution operator e to the minus IHT, where the H is actually the um, desired Hamiltonian you want to simulate. And you do this 
in a simulation time that is continuous. In a digital quantum simulation, you have to break up the time evolution operator because you don't have the access to performing this whole operation e to the minus IHT in one go. So you have to approximate this whole block uh, by some other operators that hopefully is close enough to the time evolution operator that you're after. I tell you a little bit more about what this means. And there is something in between where you can also combine the analog and digital way of uh, quantum simulating, and then maybe hopefully get a more capable quantum simulator in the short term. So a little bit more about what an analog simulator is. So first of all, what are these lines that I have put in here? Of course, um, they could represent qubits um, that are the registers for encoding information about your physical system that you want to, to simulate. But of course, in an analog simulator, despite in a digital computer, the degrees of freedom, these lines are not necessarily just qubits or spin half objects. They could be fermions, they could be bosons or spins of various dimensions and so on. So this is a capability that we can actually take advantage of. For example, if you are simulating a fermionic theory, it makes sense to encode fermions into fermions if you have the ability to actually control these fermions and do operations on them, as opposed to map them to the spins, which as we saw previously could, uh, in the previous lecture, could lead to more complicated mappings and interactions um, in the spin formulations. So what else? As I said, this Hamiltonian is hopefully the Hamiltonian of the target system. This is really the challenging part of the operation. You have to make sure to take this physical system that you have in the lab, and it intrinsically has different type of interactions and degrees of freedom compared to the target system that you are simulating, for example, lattice gauge theories, and kind of figure out how to build a Hamiltonian out of degrees of freedom and interactions that are different from your target theory. And this is called a Hamiltonian engineering process. Of course, not all the systems are going to be uh, accessible by all kinds of quantum simulators. This is really problem dependent. And that's why the analog simulators have been quite limited to certain type of quantum simulation problems and are not quite universal. But they could be very useful and very powerful if you, if you find the right simulator and the right problem. What are the, some of the leading analog simulators out there? The cold atom systems with, in optical lattices or Rydberg atoms with optical tweezers, trapped ion simulators, superconducting circuits, including when they're coupled to photonic degrees of freedom. These have shown to be really nice, powerful quantum simulators that people are increasingly de developing and making bigger and more powerful. You might have heard about quantum simulations of spin systems. And um, now I think the largest uh, spin sim simulation experiment out there, which is a 256 um, uh, um, sy spin systems by, by the Harvard group, Harvard MIT group, uh, which is quite amazing. This came out recently. And that shows you sort of the scale of things. People are starting to look at problems that are at the edge or of uh, classical computing capabilities or kind of uh, surpassing our abilities to simulate these systems with classical machines. Um, and that's sort of in the realm of the analog simulators, larger and larger systems, uh, and the more degrees of freedom can now be addressed and studied with these systems, okay? But now what about the digital scenario? So why do we want to digitize the time evolution operator if you have an analog simulator? Well, um, as I said, not all the problems are suitable for a given kind of simulator. And we might not have a good analog simulator out there for the complex interaction that we have in mind, for example, in lattice gauge theory or QCD. So it's good to have an approach that always works, always works. And that would be a digital gate-based approach that is kind of universal. What does that mean? So in this approach, first of all, the degrees of freedom are always qubit, which of course could be a limitation, but at least it puts everything in the same footing, always deal with the qubits and mapping to the qubit degrees of freedom. Of course, you can apply the same procedure to also qubits and so on. 
and then come up with the universal set of operations on higher dimensional qubits or these qubits, but that's uh, another topic. So once you have these qubits, you only have a set of uh, universal operations that you can perform. And these are single and two qubit entangling operations. So the single qubit rotations, just denoted as this, could be a couple of them. And then there is one entangling gate. I'm sure you have seen this in the quantum computing lectures. And this is called the C knot or controlled knot operation um, that acts on two qubits. And it turned out that all unitary operations can be almost efficiently um, decomposed into this set of operations, which is great. So you don't need multi qubit operations of various type. If you have access to, to these two sets of gates, then in principle, you can decompose any unitary um, to, um, to this set of gates. So what about these um, little blocks that I have here? Let's talk about them. Let's say you have a Hamiltonian that has several number of terms. So this could be a lattice Hamiltonian where each of these terms would represent interactions between certain set of um, qubits. And as long as these Hamiltonians are not sort of coupling many qubits uh, in your system that grows vo volume, and these are sort of semi-local terms in the Hamiltonian, then you can effe efficiently digitize this time evolution operator e to the minus IHT. And for example, one of the most common ways to do this is through the Trotter Suzuki expansion of this exponential. So you have e to the i minus i h1 plus h2 plus and so on t. And in case where h1 and h2 are not commuting, which is always the case with most of the physical systems that you're dealing with, then you cannot really break them to e to the minus i h1 delta t to the minus i h2 delta t and so on. And you can do this, but you always incur an error. And in this case, the error goes like uh, delta t squared, where delta t are the units of time at which you do the operations at, uh, for, for each of these exponentials. And in the limits of infinite number of um, steps, then of course you would recover the simulation in the original um, continuous time that you had in mind. There are other digitization schemes that don't rely on Trotter Suzuki expansion. So if you're interested in those more advanced, uh, but not quite near term, kind of far term simulation algorithms, um, check out this very nice lecture notes by Andrew Childs on quantum simulation. You can find them on internet and they're available. Um, so then really that's how it goes. Each of these blocks are one Trotter step of evolution. And each of these sort of sub blocks within each, each of these blocks are implementing individual terms in the Hamiltonian. So why do we do this? The reason for doing this is that now hopefully each of these terms being exponentiated is easier to find a decomposition of in terms of this single and two body gates than it is for the entire thing. Okay, so that's really the idea. And that's why it's kind of more gen gener uh, generic and universal because no matter what your Hamiltonian is, if it has this kind of semi-local property, it can be decomposed into this sort of semi-local uh, uh, terms, then the exponential of each of those terms hopefully have has an efficient decomposition that you can find, okay? So really then the art here is to find out what that decomposition is and whether there are um, a smart ways to come up with algorithms that um, uses the, the less number of qubits and the less number of entangling operations in near term or some other kind of operations in the far term, and then call it your, your favorite algorithm. For example, this has to get done in the lattice gauge theory program, and I tell, I'll show you examples of how this is done later on for the case of lattice junior model. All right, so I have an exercise here. Uh, would be good that you work through this. And it's kind of a simple one. You might have even done this before in the quantum mechanic course. Uh, it's considering this Trotter Suzuki expansion. And let's say your Hamiltonian is a sum of two terms that are not commuting. And the exercise is asking you for uh, exactly finding the form of that leading corrections to the first order Trotter expansion that ordered delta t squared in the previous slide. 
And also it asks you to go one order higher in this expansion, the second order expansion, which is, looks like this, you kind of split the operation in H1 and H2 in delta T over two, but then you do the, the other step in reverse. So what you should do in this exercise is to convince yourself that the order, the, the error would actually not come at a higher order, which is delta T cubed. So it actually is an improvement. But of course it requires um, a little bit more applying this set of gates twice in a way, okay? Um, so again, the question is what is the exact same, um, the terms that are sitting uh, as the coefficient of delta T cubed. Of course, you can use the famous BCH formula for this exercise. So I didn't talk too much about hybrid because I'm gonna just say a few words in this slide that is a comparison slide between the different approaches. And I'm gonna just compare analog hybrid and digital approaches in terms of degrees of freedom, time evolution, hardware, being hardware agnostics or not, simulation challenge, theoretical error, and error correction, okay? So again, degrees of freedom in an analog simulator could be anything that is accessible to you in the hardware and you have control over. For example, bosons, fermions, qubits, qubits, and so on and so forth. The same actually goes with the hybrid because that's kind of the spirit of doing a hybrid approach to just sort of use um, every um, resource that is available to you in the hardware and then still do the calculation in a digital way because presumably the engineering of the Hamiltonian is hard, but why not using the degrees of freedom that you have at your disposal and I still use them in a sort of gate-based way, which would be the digital side. So it's kind of sitting in the middle. And with the digital, um, you can have just the qubits, right? Time evolution uh, operation is continuous, as I told you about in analog, but it's digitized or gate-based in the hybrid and the digital approach. Um, in terms of being Harvard agnostics, obviously an analog simulation knows about the hardware because you're engineering the Hamiltonian in a particular hardware to look like the target Hamiltonian. But with the hybrid and digital approaches, it's kind of uh, not the case. So, uh, sorry, with the hybrid approach is of course uh, kind of the case because you're using the same degrees of freedom that is kind of available to you on the analog side as well. But with the digital, um, it's kind of universal. You start with the qubits and universal set of gates, and therefore you don't really care um, whose companies uh, or universities machine, this is what's being run into. You just have an algorithm, you send it to, uh, to those who implemented it, and that's it. You don't have to worry about how those gates and so on are being performed. This is very close to what we have on the classical computing side, Although if you go back many decades ago, analog computation with classical systems was a thing uh, at, uh, at some early times. What about the simulation challenge? Well, the challenge really on the analog side is to figure out how to build this Hamiltonian uh, that we're interested in out of the intrinsic interaction of the, uh, the simulator. So this engineering part is, can be hard. And in the hybrid approach, of course, figuring out how to decompose these unitary time operations to a universal limited set of gates, uh, whether on the hybrid side where you have access to more types of gates or on the digital side, when you have like these two types of single and two qubit gates, this could be challenging and you have to think carefully about how to do this. Um, there are theoretical errors in each approach. In the analog, of course, if you don't do an in perfect engineering of the interactions, you're gonna have some errors associated with the fact that the Hamiltonian of the simulator is not really the Hamiltonian of the target system. And then you have to figure out um, how, um, how much that affects the, the observables in the end of the day. And that could be really tough to figure out in, in general. And then you have errors associated with imperfect digitization, whatever the digitalization of the time evolution operator you're using, it can have its own errors. And for example, for something like Trotter Suzuki expansion, you can have a bound on this error. So generally um, you, can, you can figure out at least some bound on these errors due to digitalization. 
And there's an important topic, which is error correction. So in order to reach the fault tolerant regime of quantum computing, where you also have redundancies encoded in the system so that they can correct for certain types of errors. This has been very well developed in the digital side, the, the universal computing side. It could be possible with a hybrid approach because it's just a gate-based. For analog, it's not quite known, not in the same context as with the digital side. So it's very important to understand how to mitigate and correct for errors on the analog simulators too, because otherwise we cannot really trust the result of an analog simulator for far-term applications. Okay, um, so this is this is slide. And now with that, let's go to talk about examples of a hardware uh, where we can actually work with all these modes of simulators and understand uh, how they work. I think it's kind of important, just pick a hardware. In this case, I'm gonna talk about trapped ion systems and really go down to the level of understanding the underlying physics so that it's not just like a mystery to us when you think about this single and multi-qubit operations or Hamiltonian engineering, how really this is done. So it's good to actually see some of the basics here. So then they, you can have some idea for other types of platforms and um, how this might be done, all right? So this is going to be now a quick tour to the underlying physics of trapped ion quantum simulators. So these systems um, that I'm gonna focus on are radio frequency pole traps. So in these traps, you can have um, confining potentials that are far more confining, allowing one of the directions of the trap, in this case, the Z directions, uh, sorry, in the, in the X or Y directions, that it is in the axial direction, which is the Z direction. And as a result, these ions are aligning themselves along kind of a chain, a line, a one-dimensional chain. And this is a real picture of the ions in an actual experiment. The spacing between these ions could be of the order of few micrometers. So that's kind of the scale, okay? So what's the uh, ion laser Hamiltonian? Because as for us, um, if you're interested in the theory side of things, uh, that's all that matters, right? You have to really build the systems that is very difficult and make sure they are isolated from environment and work in the same, in the way that you hope they work. And then in the end of the day, make sure that the type of Hamiltonian interactions that are ongoing in the system are exactly what you should expect from the theory. So what is the expectation from the theory? Well, there is a free Hamiltonian for the system. And this is associated with the fact that you have internal levels of the ions and you pick two of the stable inter internal levels. These are long lived stable sort of ground and first excited states maybe of the particular ions that you pick. You kind of don't forget about the rest because you just want to address these two levels with your, with your optical or uh, electromagnetic probes. And you call them a spin up and down or qubit zero and one. Of, of the system, okay? So you can obviously see that you can extend this to more internal levels and have multi-level systems or qubits. But for the time being, let's just imagine that this is just a spin. So you have a free Hamiltonian, which is associated with sort of this Zeeman splitting of the two levels in a magnetic field that you can describe with a sigma Z poly operation, right? So one level is going to be higher in energy than the other. So this is free and when there is no laser introduced in the system yet. There's another piece to the free Hamiltonian of the trapped ion system. And that really comes from the fact that you have a set of ions sitting in a confining potential and they have an electric charge and therefore they can interact via long range Coulomb force. So if you solve this problem and this is sort of the a usual um, solving the Schrodinger equations and then finding out what the normal modes of motions are, you actually find these frequencies that I'm calling omega sub m. And of course you have these frequencies along the three different axes of the trap, could be transverse or axial. And for each of those directions, then you have n number of modes and being the number of ions in your chain. And then you can describe the excitations of motions, these normal modes of motions, with this creation and annihilation operators for the phonons, right? So this is the usual uh, quantum harmonic oscillator description of these, these phonon modes, all right? 
So what else? There is also interaction, and that's where interesting things will start to happen. You can start to address these ions with a set of lasers. And in particular, in this case, we're interested in the dipole moment interactions of these ions with an external electric field of the lasers. Okay. So here is kind of pictorially, you have a set of sort of spins or quasi spins for these internal levels of the ions. And they're kind of sitting in a chain with these normal modes of motions. But then you start to introduce these lasers, whether there could be a single laser that is like addressing everything together, or it could be individual lasers that are addressing each of the ions one by one. And then if you now write this in, in interaction and just sort of um, um, find out what this, this operation looks like, it's not hard to see that what this operation is, is has two types of components. One is operations that are happening on the spins, right, on the internal levels of these ions that are described by these Pauli matrices with some coefficients to be determined. And then there is also this Rabi frequency of the laser, which is dependent on the intensity of the lasers or the amplitude of this magnetic field, as well as the magnetic, uh, the, the, sorry, the electric uh, dipole moment of, of this uh, ions and so on. This is the Rabi frequency that is sitting here. And you can introduce multiple set of lasers. So that's why there is an index L. It could be one, it could be multiple set of lasers as we will see later on. And um, what is this factor? This is nothing but the phase factor associated with the laser, this electric field, right? It could be a time dependence, it could be, have some, some constant phase, and it could have this position dependence in particular. So omega and k are basically the laser frequencies and the wave vector, and they are acting at the position of the ions. This is the displacement of each of the ions from equilibrium position. And this is just simply time. So in fact, this is a time dependent Hamiltonian, obviously, because there are some time dependency in the laser's electric field. So again, this is Rabi frequency. This is what we call beat note frequency, because what they do is like two sets of Raman beams counter propagating. And this is kind of the, the difference between the, the frequency of those um, called beat note frequency, just the laser frequency. This is the, the difference in, in their phases. This is a difference in their momentum vector. Uh, so these are all properties of the lasers themselves that are the same type of things you have control over, right? When we do the engineering of the Hamiltonian, these are the type of things that we can actually uh, change and optimize so that we can end up with types of Hamiltonians that we would like to have um, in connection to the simulation problem we're solving, okay? And what else, as I said, this is position of the ions and therefore it really depends on trap characteristics. If you have a very confining trap, these delta R would be very small. If you have um, less confining trap, of course, then the ions would really move. Um, and this would be a different factor, okay? So at the end of the day, these omega M and delta R really are related to the position movements of the ions and therefore the characteristics of your trap. So this is again, something that you have control over. It's much harder because then you have to redo the trap thing and build the whole experiment again, if you want to change the trap characteristics, so you better not do that. So the laser parameters are the ones that are much easier in experiment to change, of course, once you build the trap. Now, um, I want to simplify this picture or at least um, get rid of some of the large oscillations in, in, in this picture, which are oscillations with this frequency, which is of the order of gigahertz um, compared to the other frequencies that are of the order of mega or kilohertz in the system. So you don't really want to uh, work um, in a frame that really oscillates fast, right? So going to a frame that where things are, are kind of a stationary with regard to this, this oscillations is the way to go. And that's why we do this interaction picture, uh, Hamiltonian, you're familiar with this in quantum mechanics. It's something that sits in between the Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture, right? It's called interaction picture. And once you do this um, usual quantum mechanical transformation with that H3 to the interaction picture, you see the following components to this in, in this interaction picture Hamiltonian. 
Well, you still have this operations on the internal levels of the ions up and down the streams, depending on uh, these coefficients that depends on this experiment and lasers and so on. But then you have to have this phase where because now we're in the interaction picture, the time dependence has sort of been pushed into these operators. Something else happened here. You remember from the previous slide, we had e to the i k i delta x. This is the same thing. What we have done is to just take this operator and then decompose it in terms of the normal modes of motions, the operators that represent normal modes of motions of these phonons, right? Because you can really expand this position operator in terms of the phonon operators, very uh, common thing that we do, we do in quantum mechanics, right? So no mystery here. That's all being done, but also going to the interaction picture that will introduce the time dependencies into the coefficients of these A and A dagger operators in the exponent. So this is already in the exponent, and this is all that happened, okay? So there's some details here, but uh, all very straightforward uh, details that you can work out. And what is now left are these dependencies on a frequency where now you see it's not just the usual frequencies, frequency minus this large frequency. So now we're dealing with something that is small and of the order of megahertz. So there are no large oscillations going on in this Hamiltonian. And there's this constant phase, and there's also the Rabi frequency associated with each of, each of those lasers. Okay. Um, so let's think about now this, uh, this bit of this Hamiltonian. It's very important. Okay. So what happens if the eta parameter, which depends really on sort of how um, fast or how, how much these ions are sort of moving away from their equilibrium position. Um, and if this eta is kind of a small and you can make this, this parameter very small in experiment, um, then you're in a regime which is called the lamb dickey regime. It's a regime where basically you have um, a small amount of excitations of the phonons in the system. The ions are kind of stationary, not moving too much, okay? Um, and in this limit, you can start to expand this form one by one. At order eta to the zero, where eta is just a shorthand for, for this factor over here, um, this factor is going to be one. What is left is whatever is here and here. So with just a single uh, laser beam, so getting rid of all these indices and so on, so there's only one Rabi frequency, you can write this very simple uh, Hamiltonian, which is called the career transition Hamiltonian. It just depends on, for example, the sigma plus and sigma minus, again, because we can set these other alpha parameters in the experiment to zero. So now this is the form. This is really uh, the basis of one qubit operations on the qubit, right? So you have the up and down of the qubit, and with this carrier operation, which is order eta to the zero of this Hamiltonian, you can start to rotate around and, and mix the up and down. And this would give you ability to perform arbitrary one qubit rotations. Okay, so this is one of those universal gates that we hope to have. The n quantum number is the number of phonons in the system. So with this operation, you're not really changing the number of phonons, just sort of mixing the up and down of the qubit. What else? Well, we can look at order eta to the one now, right? And in particular, if you're sort of uh, going close to omega m, so sort of one excitations of the phonons in each of the modes, then you can be resonant with this order eta to the one term, and therefore come up with a Hamiltonian that is called red Sideman transition. And as you can see, it has a dagger sigma minus and then a sigma plus type operators. It's proportional to eta, of course, because we expanded to order eta as well as this omega the Rabi frequency. So pictorially, what happens here is that you can have the spin phonon transitions. The spin uh, down can transition to a spin up, and in the process, one phonon gets absorbed, right? And of course, you can imagine having another set of operation when you change the spin, and in the process, you uh, sort of uh, uh, produce one, one phonons, right, in the process. And this is called 
the blue side band transitions, very similar to the previous one, except for uh, this term in A sigma minus, this term in A dagger sigma plus. Again, remember these phases are the phases of the laser. You can set them to whatever values that you hope you, you want in the experiment. And so you already see that these are spin phonon transitions that you can take advantage of if you were not just to do this kind of universal digital uh, computations, if you're interested maybe in a hybrid mode or an analog mode, these are the kind of operations that you should take advantage of because now you have a screen and kind of boson interactions. So these bosons can be useful uh, degrees of freedom to encode information in your simulation. So I'll come back to this later. But if you're interested in universal computing, it is not a spin phonon transitions, but a spin spin transitions because you're interested in two qubit operations. So what do we do? How do we achieve this, right? Given that there are all sorts of phonons in the processes, how can we couple a spin and up and down of two qubits simultaneously? And this is the scheme that is called molmer sorensen There's also a phase gate type of scheme with uh, Sirac and Zoller. But let me just talk about this, this Molmer and Sorensen scheme. And the idea is the following. You have two spin down, two spin up, and then you have a spin up, down, or down up in the middle, right? Of course, we know that with blue and red sideband transitions, we can transition between these two and these two by changing the phonon numbers at order eta. But how can we effectively transition between this up, up, and down, down without really populating this intermediate states. And this is a process that is called adiabatic elimination. I don't say much about it, although the physics is really simple. So what happens here is that you can do this trick. You can go with one set of lasers with red sideband transition, not quite red sideband, but sort of off-tuned uh, or detuned by amount delta from this uh, motion excitations or the first motion excitations. But then also introduce another set of laser, which is blue sideband, so that you can transition at least a little bit off resonantly by delta from this level all the way to this level. So you see that this is really blue because there is a phonon that is sort of created and there is sort of the, the um, red because there is a phonon that is annihilated. But both of them together are of course the resonance between up and up and down and down. So what really happens here, it turned out, is that in certain limits of the parameters, and that limit being when delta is much larger than uh, this parameter G, which is nothing but eta times omega, the Rabi frequency, then you can actually achieve operational transitions that are purely between up and down. And the population of these intermediate states actually is very close to zero. So you effectively eliminated the population in this intermediate state and directly coupled up and up and down and down. And the reason this happened is that you had these virtual type phonons in the process to take advantage of. Otherwise, this would have not been possible, okay? So this is really the basis of two qubit case. You might ask how, what exactly happened here? What's the physics? What's the mathematics of this? And it's not that hard because you can start from a Magnus expansion of the time evolution operator, which has the following form. You have to pay attention to the time ordering, of course, because you're dealing with a time dependent interaction picture Hamiltonian, which I wrote down in the previous slide. But other than that, it's the usual Magnus expansion that you must be familiar with in quantum mechanics. There's a first term and there's a second term involving two integrals with commutations of uh, H at different times and so on. Again, because this is a Hamiltonian that is time dependent and figuring out this operator requires the time ordering, okay? And then if you do this, you should be able to see that you can approximate this Hamiltonian in certain limits with an effective Hamiltonian. This operation is effectively e to the minus i h times t effective h where this effective age is now time independent. So you have like sort of a time independent Hamiltonian that is effectively describing this complicated system. Of course, we would be lucky if that happens, but it actually happens in this process of molmer sorensen scheme. And it turned out that um, given certain conditions to be satisfied, this effective interactions really 
depends on this couple operations between, for example, sigma x operators at different qubits. And in fact, these different qubits don't have to be sitting next to each other. It can be qubits at different places on your chain that can have all to all interactions between the qubits, well, simply because these, opera, these, these ions are really sort of uh, behaving kind of in a collective base. And uh, that's the notion of the collective normal mode. So you can really connect different parts of the chain using these operations that we define with the normal modes of motions. And this is that condition that we already talked about. Delta has to be much larger than this eta times omega so that we can have effectively this adiabatic elimination that we talked about in this picture. So you can already see it from a math of this process as well, if you work it out. And in fact, because there's so much in this, this um, the slide that I didn't talk about, I have an exercise here that would allow you to drive that effective Hamiltonian that is proportional to sigma x i sigma x j. And I'm sorry, I'm changing the notations about x being up and down or the i's and j's being inside the parentheses from a slide to a slide. These are all meant to um, mean the same thing, okay? Um, anyway, so the question is asking for taking the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of the blue and red side man in that figure, as we saw, which I have given you the explicit form here, um, and then figure out what the effective Hamiltonian is by really going through this um, procedure here, starting from that Hamiltonian in the exercise of slide, and then working out the Magnus expansion and convince yourself and then in certain limits, you get an H effective that is proportional to sigma x, sigma x. And in fact, with coefficients that would look like this, okay? So I'd be happy to talk about this if you have questions about it, but I encourage you to go through it because I mean, um, as I said, this should not remain a mystery to you how these entangling operations are done in a given quantum computer. So this is one reason uh, to go through this exercise. All right, so now what are the digital analog and hybrid modes of these trapped ion simulator? Because I kind of talked about the basic operations, the basic Hamiltonian in the previous slides. So what are the different modes for this trapped ion simulator? Well, the digital mode we already talked about, as I said, there are these career transitions that would do the spin single spin operations or single qubit operations for you. And you have this molmer sorenson operation, which is proportional to sigma x, sigma x, and then you can tailor it and optimize it in many different ways. And you can have these two qubit gates based on this molmer sorenson scheme. So we already talked about this, right? And this could be sort of all to all. It doesn't have to be just local. And this is one of the nice things about these trapped ion systems. They don't only have operations that are entangling on nearest neighbor sites or qubits, but it could be all to all entangling operations, which is a good thing for algorithms. In the analog side, there is no gate, right? So we have a continuous evolution of the system with some Hamiltonian, but hopefully this Hamiltonian looks like the effective Hamiltonian that we're interested in. So if you're interested in simulating something like Ising model, uh, which is basically sigma x, sigma x with some effective uh, magnetic field that you can do with this trapped ion systems, uh, then yes, you can do this as long as your coupling coefficients um, are basically some power law uh, that you can sort of fit this, this exponent to whatever you're interested in. You can do very nice sort of analog simulations of these icing chains, um, which is hard classically for long chains, of course. And, uh, there's been very nice demonstration of this type of simulations. But of course, not everything we're interested in in a spin Ising model, and particularly in lattice gauge theory, we're interested in more complex systems. So you can start to generalize the system to, to this effective Hamiltonian to be more uh, enabling. For example, it could simulate a Heisenberg type, type Hamiltonian if you introduce more set of lasers and you parameterize, uh, you, you tune them and optimize them properly, right? It's again, the art to really find the right set of parameters here. And um, so this can, for example, as we will see, simulate the Schrodinger model, okay? I'll, I'll tell you about that in a moment. You can also go beyond this picture. You can also try to engineer 
going to higher order picture in this Molmer and Sorenson to, for example, induce triasmin interactions. Again, this could be very useful for simulating some uh, simpler lattice gauge theories, but more complex than the icing model, right? So you can start to play this game and come up with protocols and uh, kind of laser settings and laser parameters and so on and so forth in such a way that really sort of enable more complex effective Hamiltonians to be engineered in these systems, okay? What about the hybrid approach? Well, the hybrid approach, when you have analog digital case, you still have the set of gates, right? And in particular, you have the usual single qubit and two qubit Molmer Sorenson gates. But now you can take advantage of the fact that spins and phonons talk to each other. And you have this spin phonon blue and red sideband transitions. Why not taking advantage of those? And you can actually have two sets of gates depending on the parameter regime and experiment you're working with for these spin phonon transitions. You can even get more smart and come up with sort of phonon phonon type transitions that you might need in your uh, target Hamiltonian, you can use some sort of standing wave gates. So if you're interested in the details of this, just look at this publication. But just look, I want to give you sort of a general picture of what the analog system means. You still have your qubits, but you also have your phonons. And you have a gates, but you have a more uh, extended set of gates as opposed to just a universal set of gates. Okay, so that's the picture for these trap ion simulators. So with that, we can now focus on the example of a lattice Schrunger model. Let's see for a lattice gauge theory that we're interested in, how can we perform digital simulations, which is universal. So it really doesn't matter whether I'm using a trapped iron system or something else, as well as an analog simulation, which would depend on a trapped ion interactions and Hamiltonians and how we engineer them as well as the hybrid approach, which again is, is unique to this trapped on systems. If you want to do it in a different hardware, that would be different set of gates and operations. Okay. So what is this lattice gauge theory that we want to look at in this trapped on simulator where we already talked about it in, in the context of Hamiltonian formulation of lattice gauge theories, because that's kind of the simplest gauge theory that we can write and has interesting features that are very similar to QCD. And that's the U1 gauge theory coupled to matter in one plus one dimension, or just simply the Schrunger model. And in the staggered formulation of Kogan and Soskin, of course, then you have uh, this lattice Schrunger model that, in the end of the day, are basically just fermions and antifermions sitting at uh, staggered sites. There are uh, electric fields um, a squared, which is the, Hamilton, the electric Hamiltonian. And you have the gauge links that are the conjugates to the electric field sitting in between the fermions, right? And then you also have these staggered mass terms. So this is the Hamiltonian that we worked out in the first lecture, okay? And uh, so one thing to remember from lecture one was that we performed the gauge transformation as well as applying Gauss's law with open boundary conditions so that we can actually get rid of these gauge degrees of freedom. So a representation for this Hamiltonian could be just purely a spin Hamiltonian, where I have done a Jordan Wigner transformation to fermions to the spins, but I have also removed the U and E in this representation in favor of this fermionic or now the sigma type operations. Okay, so this is the form that we actually worked out in the previous lecture. And for the sake of examples that I'm going to show you, I'm going to use both types of Hamiltonians, because eventually we're interested in something that has the gauge links, because this trick of removing them doesn't always apply, and particularly in higher dimensions and with other boundary conditions. We cannot take advantage of tricks like this so that we only have a spin system. We have to really deal with bosonic degrees of freedom. So I'm going to focus on both types of Hamiltonian in the examples that I want to show you. Okay. So again, features of this spin Hamiltonian. This is really a nearest neighbor spin-to-spin -spin interaction. It's kind of xx plus y, y interaction in the end of the day. And this is a long range spin-to-spin -spin interaction, plus also an effective magnetic field proportional to sigma z. This is supposed to be a small z, not uh, capital Z, but anyway. Um, so there are different terms in this Hamiltonian. And you can already see that it's kind of 
not the simplest Ising type Hamiltonian that you can imagine that these systems have access to naturally. So we have to get more clever about how to engineer this in a trap on system in an analog way. Okay, so let's get it started. Let's say that I'm interested in a digital simulation of this Hamiltonian, the spin Hamiltonian that I had in the previous slide. And uh, now this is really the mapping, right? You have the Schunger model with this electric fields and gauge links sitting on the links. You have the, the fermion fields sitting at the sides. And then what you can do is to go to the speed formulation so you don't have to worry about mapping these bosonic degrees of freedom to your trap iron simulator. Just map the fermions to the spins through the Jordan Wigner transformation. So that's nice. Um, and then you use this collective modes of uh, normal modes of motion to sort of perform two ion entangling gates. And then you also have the career transition to do the one single ion rotations. Okay. So then the question is that what does the, the, gate, the gate representation of this Hamiltonian would look like? Well, it's just the XX, YY, ZZ type interactions. And you have already seen example of quantum simulation of Ising model in the quantum computing lectures. So they have, don't have to tell you much about how to decompose this into the circuit. So it has more terms, but in the end of the day, the building blocks are going to be the same as with the Ising model. So this is, these are the terms. You have molmer sorensen type gates to couple the spins or the qubits, and you have single qubit rotations. So this would be fermionic gauge uh, interactions. This would be the gauge field or the electric field interactions that are now these long range two qubit interactions, sigma z, sigma z type operations here. And you also have the fermionic master, obviously, which is just a single qubit rotations by sigma z. So that's really the quantum circuit. It's kind of simple compared to other things that you can imagine. I talk about those other things. But then also you have to, you might be interested in now implementing a quantum simulation of this model, given that you have the quantum circuit. And this is sort of what was done in this early work by Innsbruck group a few years ago, which was kind of exciting. They looked at a foresight Schunge model, a small system, because these simulators are not that large to do larger problems for us at the moment. But it's still doing sort of this digital approach to the simulation, you can look at interesting properties like particle number density as a function of time and look at the creation and annihilation of the pairs as a function of time as starting from some uh, trivial state. So this was quite exciting. And um, we can do this now in more capable simulators at the moment and really sort of push the limits of the simulation times and have more entangling gates and using all sorts of tricks and error mitigations to actually perform better than you can do with the current simulation as, as we are sort of exploring at the moment at the University of Maryland. Um, so what about now the analog approach, right? So that was the digital, okay? What about the analog approach if you are still dealing with this spin Hamiltonian? It's just kind of a Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So as I told you before, now, again, the degrees of freedom are just two to the spins or two to the internal levels of the ions. But now in order to make the spins or the qubits to talk to each other in a particular way that this Hamiltonian dictates, then we have to introduce more set of complicated set of lasers. Instead of just one set of Raman beams, you have to have three sets of Raman beams that are addressing three different sets of normal modes of motions and make sure to the, they won't sort of crosstalk and introduce undesired couplings, you have to control that. So it's a very intricate job uh, to come up with the right parameters. But in the end of the day, you can actually show that you can engineer these nearest neighbor interactions, for example, with a set of laser parameters, Rabi frequencies and beat node frequencies for, for these lasers, but also this interesting long range pattern for the electric field interactions in this picture by finding the right parameters for, for your experiment. So it's kind of a classical optimization. This is not hard. It's actually linear in the size of the system. So it's not really exponential. And you can do this classical optimization to find the right parameters and perform an analog simulation with this, this Hamiltonian. 
So in order to make some of the details a little bit more clear, I have um, uh, this exercise here because I want to make sure that now you can actually perform um, an optimization, understand how to kind of uh, go about the experiment and make sure it reproduces the sort of the interactions and patterns that you are hoping to get for your target system, okay? So this is really filling in some of the details from the previous slide for a case of just four ions, okay? So you're interested in four uh, staggered sites. Um, there are two parts to the problem. The first part is asking to just focus on the electric field Hamiltonian, forget about the rest. Just let's look at the electric field Hamiltonian, which has the following form. Figure out exactly what the coupling between the different sigma z's and the chain is. So come up with a sort of coupling matrix for HZZ and what is left. But then number, uh, the, the part B of the problem is to say, all right, I know what the effective Hamiltonian of this system is. I kind of showed you this form in a different form before, but that's the same thing, which has like sigma Z type, sigma Z type interactions. Then how should we set these rabbi frequencies and mu in the experiment so that we exactly reproduce the coupling pattern that we want for this HZZ in the Schrodinger model, okay? So you need to set off input parameters, including for these uh, eigenvectors of the normal modes of motions, for the eigenvalues of the normal modes of motions, for this recoil parameter and so on. I have provided those in the last slide of, of this talk. So in order to do this, this part, you would need those parameters. And there are some bonus part to, to this problem. Um, all right, so that's the exercise. Let's now talk about the digital approach to the problem again, but in a scenario in which I'm not really removing the gauge link. So the Hamiltonian is the one that I had on the top of the, the slide before. It includes the gauge links and electric fields. What that means is that we have to now also encode these bosonic degrees of freedom into the qubits or more ions, right? So that means that we actually need more qubit resource to encode the system, obviously, because we have more degrees of freedom. We have these bosons. So you can have a binary encoding of these bosons. Remember, these are described by integer um, basis of state, as we talked about before in lecture number one. So you can put a cutoff on the number of excitations of these bosons and sort of encode them to something of the order of logarithm of lambda, not exactly depending on how you do the encoding, but something of the order of logarithm of this lambda number of excitations. And you still have your qubits representing your fermions and there are a bunch of qubits representing your gauge links that are sitting in between. Okay, so in a digital sense, again, everything is the same. You have the molmer sorenson gates based on these collective virtual excitations of motions, and you have also single qubit rotations. Then now, again, the challenge or the art of simulation here is to find out what exactly each of these terms would represent in terms of universal set of gates. When you do e to the minus iht and then sort of do the trotter expansion, and a separate out various different terms, how do you come up with a quantum circuit that would represent that efficiently? And that's the part that sort of a quantum algorithm expert has to figure out. And that quantum algorithm expert should uh, happen to be also a lattice gauge theorist to understand these, these systems, right? And also collaborate with the ones that have a better idea of uh, all these sort of building blocks of quantum circuits and more efficient ways to perform these operations. So this is an example that I sort of took from this nice paper by Shaw and collaborators um, um, a year or two ago. And they have done a very thorough job of uh, analysis of the error bands and the resource requirements of the Schrodinger model for various different terms here. So you can see the gauge fermion interactions, which is this first term. You can see the part that represent the electric field interactions. And also, of course, the, the, the mass term, which is trivial in this case again. So it's a far more complicated circuit than I showed for the spin representation, obviously, because now you have also these bosonic excitations that these qubits for the bosons that are really coupling to both fermions, but also coupling to themselves. 
right? So you have to account for that and come up with a circuit that represents um, uh, exactly the e to the minus IHT within this Trotter expansion. Then you can start to count what are the number of entangling gates that, for example, you may need to reach certain accuracy or, or precision in the observables in various different coupling regime of the theory. So these are the type of algorithmic analysis and progress that we need as we move towards simulating QCD in this field, okay? Uh, so you have seen a glimpse of this. And this exercise number four is really to fill in some of the, the details. I'm not gonna focus on the more challenging terms like this term. I'm gonna focus on something that is a bit simpler, but it still requires a little bit of um, uh, uh, tricks and, and uh, uh, clever sort of ideas of how to simulate this term. Um, so let's say that we're just interested in e to the minus i delta t, the sum of electric field terms squared at each side. And we're asking the question of what is the circuit that represents this operation. Here, I have given you some hints of how to perform this operation. And at the core of it is to really map these electric field basis states into these binary representations, the qubits, so that you can map them to the qubits. And I use certain tricks to relate this to operations in terms of Pauli Z rotations, but also the C not entangling gates. So this would be one of the exercises that we would work out through, through the problem solving session later this week, right? So finally, what about the analog digital approach? Well, in this approach, I don't have to now map the bosonic degrees of freedom into a spins, which is not very efficient, I can just map these bosonic degrees of freedom into the bosonic degrees of freedom of this simulator, which are the phonons. So that's where you get some efficiency gain. And in principle, if you have good control over the phonon degrees of freedom as well. So again, with the Hamiltonian that has the gauge links itself, we are going to use this analog digital approach so that we can use the encoding of the bosons into the bosons and then using the operations that I showed before in terms of spin phonon operations and phonon phonon operations, then perform these gauge fermion interactions as well as electric field interactions. So this is the circuit that you can come up with with the building blocks that I introduced before. And in particular, you can see that how simpler it is now in terms of these more extended sort of gates compared to the digital algorithm with the same Hamiltonian that I showed before. And the reason for that is that we don't introduce more ions or more qubits, we just encode everything in phonons that already exist in your system. So this would be kind of a snapshot of what you should expect for a quantum circuit of, of this model. This has not been implemented yet, but hopefully this would be possible because these trap ion simulators are starting to actually do perform experiment on the phonons in a very controlled way. So that's very promising. So with that, I sort of conveyed uh, the messages that I wanted to convey in this talk, talking about different approaches to the simulation, an example of a simulator that works in different modes of the simulation, and an example of a simple lattice gauge theory that can be simulated with different modes of this particular simulator that I talked about. So now you can imagine that you can sort of uh, apply this to other types of hardware. You have to understand the physics of those hardwares, particular for analog and hybrid uh, digital analog approach, but also understanding how to, to come up with quantum algorithms in a more digital kind of universal way of doing the simulation uh, program. Um, this is good. This really means that we cover a lot of basics. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that you still have all the important knowledge to do uh, all sorts of problems and research problems in this field, although it actually gets you started on those, I hope. And what are the type of problems that we didn't really talk about? And some of these are solved, some of them are unsolved. These are open problems and people are actively thinking about approaching them. So this is not really late for you to get into this game. So what are some of these problems? Well, how to incorporate non-abelian symmetries and go beyond one plus one dimensions. 
how do we prepare states in gauge theories, given that these states could be very non-trivial? Uh, measurement and observables, how do we calculate the scattering amplitude, the structure functions, all sorts of things we're interested in hadronic and nuclear physics, for example. Um, what, how do we perform exact error-bound analysis for different simulation algorithms for near-term and far-term? So in the near-term, we care about the number of qubits and its entangling gauge that is quantifying the cost of the simulation in the far-term. We don't really care about the number of qubits, but it's sort of the non Clifford T type gates. Uh, if you don't know what it is, that doesn't matter, but the T gates that really quantifies the uh, expense of the calculation. Um, there are hybrid classical quantum approaches to simulation we didn't talk about, such as variational quantum eigen solvers. Um, the question of what is the role of tensor network methods in quantum simulation for gauge theories, this uh, is an interesting question when people are thinking about it. Um, error correction and error mitigation is very important, especially in the context of gauge theories when you're dealing with very complicated and long circuits and you can lose coherence very quickly. <clears throat> How to do meaningful simulation near-term devices given that we don't have um, access to sort of noise resilient and fault tolerant devices at the moment. Um, and of course, more detailed analysis of all sorts of quantum platforms and leading analog and hybrid proposals that we didn't really cover here besides the trap line systems. And uh, there's so much going on out there that it's just impossible to just cover in an hour or so. But hopefully uh, you are already equipped with um, the set of tools and basic ideas from both lectures on quantum computing and quantum simulation to start exploring this very exciting and fastly evolving field of research if you desire. Um, so it's time to really get into this game. <clears throat> and with that, uh, I hope to see you in the problem solving sessions. Bye-bye. Um,